A vague disclaimer is no one's friend. This podcast will look at episodes in relation to Buffy and Angel as a whole, and therefore contains spoilers for the entirety of both series. If you haven't seen all of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel the series, go and watch them before you listen to this. Remember, you've been warned. The hardest thing in this world is to live in it. That's why there's us, champions. We live as though the world were as it should be, to show it what it can be. The Earth is definitely doomed. It's Tuesday, so it must be time to return to the Hellmouth. We're going through the Buffyverse episode by episode, and a look back at Joss Whedon's iconic shows. I'm MC, and I'm here with... It is Andy. And this is David. And this is Jan. Uh, Today we are talking about Becoming Part 1, which is episode 21 of season 2. It originally aired May 12th, 1998, and was written and directed by Joss Whedon. So we did it, guys. We're at uh, the final two episodes of season two. Yeah. And wow. Um, I, I mean, you always know that Becoming is like such a major episode, but when you actually sit down and watch it, it's like it's even more than I think... I even remember like me too yeah now becoming part one i was a little bit like all right but but when we get to becoming part two next week i'll i'll be like whoa but like i mean obviously a one part of a two-part episode can be sort of the plot of exposition but it's still an amazing episode yeah i at at the beginning of part two i was uh i I realized about like five or ten minutes in it's like oh i've totally forgotten to take notes (laughs) (laughs) yeah Because I was just watching it. It's just, yeah. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that next week. So we start out with uh, a narration from Whistler. And we're in Galway, Ireland, 1753. Uh, interesting note, uh, this uh, narration is actually different from the original episode. The, oh, original, really? the original airing, it was actually David who uh, provided the voiceover. Mm. Really? Huh. Yeah, uh, huh. it was just for the first scene. Uh, he provided. Oh, just the for the over. first scene. Okay. Yeah, hmm. but then hmm. they re-recorded it, and it is lost forever. Though I might have the VHS. I might. <laughs> no, my... no, my I might have the VHS at my mom's house. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because by this point, I was uh, taping Buffy first airings. I was like, I gotta tape it, and I don't I know was if I got too, rid of them. And in the next episode, I'll tell you a story about the heartbreak and the what happened with the becoming part one versus becoming part two because i didn't see it for three months after it aired uh-huh. uh, i was heartbroken um, yeah. so yeah i really but, like the voiceover yes um and we get our first look at angel's life when he was still liam yes and the first thing we le- learn is david boreanaz should not try to do accents <laughs> i was gonna say my note says oh the accent is back I said David's accent. Oh God! <laughs> but you are, but you are a pretty thing, aren't you? Oh God! <laughs> oh, God. Let go of your lucky that... charms. <laughs> Thankfully, Julie Benz does not even attempt an accent. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if, like, they do make Darla American, even though that's a tar- terrible reason for her not to have an accent, because back in those days, yeah, she would right, have she an accent anyways. Yeah. But I'm wondering, like, how terrible Julie Benz's accents must be if they were just like, okay, David's is okay, but Darla, you just do a, an American accent. And actually, linguistically, apparently, the English accent was not the English accent that we have today. Oh, no, it As, wasn't. I was actually a lot closer to an american accent. But not the American accent she's got. Not the American accent. Not a modern day. It's more. I think it's more like New England and or Southern. Yeah, it's 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 a weird mixture, and we actually kept what the original English had, and their 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 accents evolved. So I mean, it's it's whatever. It's a director's choice and what they want to do with accents. But um, but yeah, she's hers is terrible. (laughs) His is terrible. I'm sorry. Um, hers is non-existent because yeah i i remember watching this for the first time and not catching it was darla till almost the end of that scene (laughs) until she like like it took me i'm like who is this person i don't 
Because we hadn't seen Darla. Since Angel. Since Angel. Right? And I know it's like only a season later, but like she had her hair down. She looked like a teenager. She was wearing mm. like a Catholic schoolgirl outfit. Like it took me a a while to snap that that was who that was. And had you started taping them in season one? No, I started taping. I started taping on Prophecy Girl. Okay, so it was actually it had been a very long time since you had seen. It had her been a while a since I'd seen her, and then I got it eventually, and I loved her dress. Because mm-hmm. mm. um, at this exact same time, I was doing a production of Tartuffe. Um, oh, and I'm, yeah. A, I'm yeah, and so my dress was a lot. I've shown you guys a picture of that dress before, but um, oh yeah. But yeah, so I was like, oh, panniers. I love a good, which are the wide things on the top, you yeah. know, the sides of the skirt. But I love a good pannier. I also think the costume designers did a great job because Julie Benz's boobs are not that big. No, they aren't. Like, when I did Chartreuse, my boobs were, we didn't have to do much to make them stick up like that, let me just say. But Julie Benz is much smaller, which is, I mean, boobs, not boobs. It's not a big deal. They're, we know we're both lovely people. But, yeah, I thought they did a good job getting those things ratcheted up there. <laughs> Hiking them up so that you could have the most sexual of turnings. Oh, because, right? I mean, like, turnings are sexual, like, just in general. Mm. But this one yeah. was just like, this is Anne Rice territory. Yeah. Well, and yeah. also, well, it wasn't directly. I think on purpose. Yeah, it wasn't directly on the boobs. It was above it. So it had a, like, sexual mother kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. It had that, it's yeah. that creepy, like, sexy times, but because of the breasts and how he sucks on the... It, it, it's kind of creepy. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. scene is great, besides his accent. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Also, by the way, do, do vampires have, like, exacto knives in the pads of their fingers? Because <laughs> she just draws her finger across when she cuts herself open. Well, I mean, the it's same like... thing happens at the end of the episode, so I guess vampire fingernails are stronger yeah. than... Well, no, but she, yeah. but she doesn't actually use her fingernail. It's like, in the first, like, it's it's actually, there's a cut there. Like, she starts with her fingernail, then it cuts to a different angle, and she's just drawing her finger across. She's not even using the nail. <laughs> well, it's, we, we know the whole reason for it is because she had, like, paint or makeup on so that she could draw right. it across, but. Yeah. Well, yeah. There, there's, in these two episodes, there's a lot of production errors and that yeah, i think yeah. is one of them and i mean you got to remember this is also still very early on in joss's directing career mm-hmm. so he hadn't yes. quite figured out how to hide certain things so yes. yeah i mean he it's I'll not have a nice production rant later it's mm-hmm. not it's not a badly directed episode it's just not oh, no again we talked when we talked about the direction on passion like i'm not as enraptured of the direction on this as i was a passion for sure because he's more of an amateur. I mean, he hasn't directed much. He's directed one thing so far. But yeah, I love the scene. And I think I remember being like stunned about like, wait, what are we? Where are we doing? We're in the past? Who's that? What's going on? And yeah. like that sort yeah. of learning about, you know, I think Becoming Part 1 is about Angel's becoming. Yeah. And Part 2 is about Buffy's. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, and so we go to the present and uh, we find out about shit that's buried in Sunnydale. Because everything is in Sunnydale. Yeah. Always. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, I mean, I th- this is one of the first examples of something being unearthed in Sunnydale that, you know, it's going to, you know, is evil or I mean, there's I mean, I'm wondering, is this right next to like the effigy of Prof- Prosopexa? that Willow will unearth later on. I mean, is there just like this underground bunker of all of this, you know... Kind of like at the end of Indiana Jones? Yes. Yes. You just The the evil people just stroll through and go, I will take that one. And we get a little bit of uh, Giles' backstory, or, you know, a little hint. Um, We find out that he is the best expert in obscure relics. Right here in Sunnydale. Right. Well, that's why the Watchers said, I mean, it's Sunnydale. It's a hellmouth, so yeah, that is uh-huh. why Buffy is stationed there, and that's why Giles is her watcher there. So, yeah. and apparently, it's the location of Hell's mini storage, <laughs> right? Yeah. For sure. I I don't know a lot about archaeology, but I do feel like there were a couple of steps missed, like because they're 
Uh, they've already sent off, you know, samples to be carbon dated, but he hasn't realized that it's a box, that he, he thinks that it's solid. Well, I feel like one of the first things they would do would be to, like, x-ray it or... Mm-hmm. Uh, it's yeah. Sunnydale. Just... Everybody is extra dumb. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, of course, they, they don't even say that he's an archaeologist. They say he's the curator, so... I, I don't True. know why yeah. Yeah. a museum curator is working on that. But we did skip over uh, Buffy's fight scene. Uh, Buffy fighting the vampires, which is very fighty. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Extremely fighty. Extremely fighty. I, I'm sorry, but I've said this before. Buffy speak has really crept into our language. I mean, I know we're on a Buffy yeah. podcast, so it's easy to say things like fighty and you know, verbify mm-hmm. words, but that's this is where it all comes from, and I yeah. it seeped into my consciousness. I find oh, yeah. it's no. a perfectly good word. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's really formed my my linguistics. Me too. Oh, it really yeah. has. I was yeah, saying, and I didn't. I mean, you guys are much more hardcore than I am, and it comes into my my language use too. Yeah, it's come into popular culture, and especially in in geek culture. So. Yeah. Anyway, the fight was fighty. Yes, there's not really a lot to say about the fight scene other than it does lead into probably one of my top ten favorite Xander moments ever, and that's Fish Stick Theater. The Fish Stick Theater is yes, it is. Be yes. I mean Xander, I think sucks hardcore in these two episodes, but that is, and that's something I would do. I would grab. I mean, it's just one of those. Like, all right, I get you, Xander. I, I get your... And that the theme was by American, but it got lost. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's good. I think. Of course, back in the day, my friends and I made so many jokes about him saying by American. We were like, <laughs> he's actually saying by as in B-I. Oh, uh, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we were all Xander and Larry, Xander and Larry. I don't know, judging by Oz's shirt later on, I think it might be Oz and Larry. But... <laughs> well, I was going to mention that. But uh, here, Xander's Fish Stick Theater uh, does also remind me, it's it's like proto-wash. It is. Yeah. Yeah. With yes. the dinosaur. Yeah. 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 And I a lot of times I think that Wash from Firefly is one of the, is a really elevated version of Xander. He's Xander without, without all the all problematic the, shit. Without all the problematic yeah. shit. And I I, I think yeah. Wash is like one of the... He's, he's my space yeah. boyfriend. So, because I like snarky. I like funny. I don't like bullshit women massage. You know what I mean? So... Oh. Mm. But Fish Stick Theater is pretty great. Yes. And, and we see, like, the Scooby Gang. And this is... the When I think of the Scooby Gang, this is what I think Me of too. as the Scooby yeah. Gang. This is Buffy and Willow and Xander and Cordelia and, Cordelia. and Oz. Mm-hmm. And this is like the maybe the second time that we've really seen them all hanging out just as a group. But this is the mm-hmm. first time that they've been hanging out as a group that isn't connected to them, like investigating something. Because the first time was right, in phases. Out- yeah, I mean, they, t- they talk about stuff, but they're not reading about it. They're not researching. They're just shooting the shit in the cafeteria yeah and being cute and adorable and sort of coupley except for buffy but yeah it works really well so and willow sitting in oz's lap i know right Mm -hmm. Ah. i I didn't hear about a chair shortage Ah. yeah (laughs) they've really gotten past that being uh uh, scared to kiss each other yeah yeah yeah. for sure they're just like so unbelievably adorable and it just like made me squee watching yeah it also this scene also Um, has my second favorite cordy line of all time the first being like tax is just not saying true stuff and i've used this i've used this as an insult and only about 60 percent of the time will i attribute it to buffy sometimes i'll just pass it off as mine which is um he's a tiny impotent nazi with a bug up his butt the size of an emu (laughs) <laughs> yeah, my note is that I really think that bug is larger than Nemu. <laughs> but like that is my favorite insult. I have used it. I will mm-hmm. continue to use it, but it is it is Cordelia Gold. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh and I mean like oh the couples are just so cute. Like uh I th- I think you sweat cute blood. Yeah. Oh, no. and, and I also 
I like Xander basically turning into Gomez Adams with Cordelia. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, noticed there's a box of animal crackers on the table. I didn't oh, notice I didn't that. See that. Good, okay. Good call. Yeah. Well, I mean, I noticed it also in the last episode that they had animal crackers at the bronze. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I, I mean, it, that one I noticed, but I missed 100% it. 100% intentional. It this week, so. Yeah. 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 This is Oz just really <laughs> likes animal crackers. And, mm-hmm. Uh, so I really, now I do think that, that the animal crackers at the bronze was actually... Dingo's ate my baby merch, like I said last week. It's now it's a branding thing for Oz. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting residuals on those animals. <laughs> then we get to a flashback in uh, London, eighteen sixty. I think yeah. is the next scene, uh, and it's uh, Drusilla. Before Drusilla is, you know, a crazy vampire. She is. And this is, I think, the first time we actually find out that Drusilla's visions predate her becoming a vampire. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. So, and I just, God, Julia uh, Landau was so good in this. I mean, she's absolutely wonderful. Just like, it it made me sad. Just like watching mm -hmm. it. Like, true. Back when you were like normal. Ah." I'm assuming that Drusilla is younger than Juliet. Because Juliet was yeah. like 32, what, 31, 32 when this was oh. being oh, okay. shot. Yeah. And, well, they, yeah. it, it, yeah. and they make it seem like Drusilla. I mean, it might have been one of those, oh my God, these two people are so great for the parts, James and Juliet, and they're good, you know, and their chemistry and all that stuff without really thinking about, mm-hmm. you know, stuff later. Because, I mean, maybe he's been torturing, yeah, maybe he's been torturing her for so many years and she is slightly older. Because she's been sort of sequestered by her parents because of the visions and, you know, because I think her family, it, it's pretty, I mean, what the line she says talks about, you know, like, right? Am I right? Am I missing something? Did my brain go fuzzy? No. No. But no. like, you know, maybe she has been, you know, sort of sequestered and only gone to church and her family mm-hmm. thinks the visions are problematic or whatever, but... I think, like, makeup-wise, et cetera, I mean, she looked... I, t- I figured she was, like, under 20. Like, I got the feeling she was, like, 16, 17, maybe. Like, she seemed to be not only, like, mentally young, but I think mm-hmm. physically she was supposed to be Right, but then you have very yeah. hard, sharp, womanly, you know, vampire Drew, yeah. which is kind of at odds age-wise. So, I mean, it's just one of those casting things and age things that I'm always like... I mean, but it's also, you know, the WB, so whatever. Well, we also don't know how long Angel was supposed to be stalking right. her. Right, like, I think it was a while, right. yeah. so. Yeah, because yeah, I got the feeling that at least the confession scene, she was much, that was like early Drusilla. Like he was going to, mm-hmm. this was like the very beginning where he was interacting with her and it was going to go on much longer, so she will age. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. my headcanon has always been that like, he'd torture her for a while when she he was, you know, around and then him and, you know, Darla would go off and do some other kind of, thing together or take a trip to Italy and kill people there and then he'd come back and torment her some more and you know I mm-hmm. I've always assumed it was over a yeah. period of years yeah yeah same that it wasn't just like you know a couple months and then she was gone it was like a long yeah. drawn out thing on purpose this is playing cat and mouse with her I actually um one of the things that I've put on my to-do list of fanish stuff that I need to do is I would like to make a fan edit like basically a movie of uh, called Angelus, which is with chronological all of the flashbacks of uh, Angelus and all of the rest of the world when put together into a movie. Because I think it probably once you put them together, it probably would be about two hours. So once I go back and actually start to put them together, I can see when this episode, because it is dated, it's London 1860. Mm-hmm. I can see that where that compares to the other flashback where we actually see uh, Angel siring Drusilla. Right. Uh, right. And which happens over on Angel. Um, can't remember which episode that is now off the top of my head. It might be Dear Boy or something. But but I know they actually do have uh, Drusilla get, so, get sired. So then we go back to the present and uh, Drusilla has come back in. And we see the total difference between young Drusilla with the visions and Drusilla the vampire going out to hunt men at night. Though, yeah. I mean, like, it 
the way that was shot, it did not look like night when she was walking in. It looked pretty bright. Hmm? But whatever. And I really like that Spike reads the paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. (laughs) Because underneath it all, Spike is sort of bookish and you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm not not saying everything about, I mean, he's a lot of bravado, right? But not everything about Spike is just, you know, that he's got some other, which is why I love Spike. I, I also like the implication that, you know, Drew's whole crazy spooky thing isn't entirely real. Yeah, oh, a little bit. Yeah, some of it is really put on for sure. She's like, is that in your head? It's like, no, she read it in the paper. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Which it's like, I, be- it's, I so believe. She, I mean, it's clear that she's playing them. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it's clear anyway, but it's even clearer once you go, it's like, oh yeah, some of this is really just an act. Yeah. No, I, that comes yeah. up again in Angel when she, uh, she and Drusilla, when she and Darla are in uh, the bomb shelter with the lawyers, mm-hmm. and she's mm. uh, talking about all of the people cowering in fear, and Lila thinks that she's like having a vision of what it was like when it was used as a bomb shelter, and Darla's like, "No, she's talking about now." <laughs> yeah, I mean, she uses. I mean, Drusilla is not numb, and she's. The, uh, no. I mean, the first no. half of the season, she's got the whatever mystical you know, uh, yeah, weakness. Yeah. Mystical thing. consumption. Mystical consumption. But after her, after that, Drusilla is not weak. Yeah. And she is, she no, knows no. to, not at all. And she knows she's got a persona and that's totally fine. You know, I would have always liked to see sort of what her relationship with Spike was alone and how, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. what did they talk about? And Maybe she dropped some of the weirdness or, I mean, because she is a, yeah. tor- you know, she was tortured and she is quite the yeah. kook, but, you know, oh, she yeah. does, she no, does she, play yeah. She is crazy. She's not just, just not as crazy as she sometimes makes it out. Yeah. yeah. And I hate that yeah. word, by the way. Oh, yeah, we, sorry. But with Drusilla, she's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's. We do um, get to see a little bit of Drusilla and Spike alone in Crush when she comes back. Yeah. But I do think we were really, um robbed of a lot of drusilla stuff considering after crush and the arc she had on angel juliet refused to come back to buffy during the present day she right only she would only do was only willing to do flashbacks yeah because she didn't want She's drusilla like, to not, be killed I'm off not getting killed off yeah which is hilarious yeah. but that's actually really funny i love that it's really yeah. great but um i, I mean i love yeah. i love kooky drew it's and then uh, we move on to Buffy and Willow in the computer lab, because mm-hmm. apparently right. that's all Willow <laughs> does in school now is teach computer class. See the floppy disk yep. again. And yes. um, for yellow floppy disk to the rescue. For those who watched it on first run, or you know, the first time any of us watched this, did any of you remember that floppy disk? Yes. I was like, wait, that's yes. Because I remember very clearly it dropped where it dropped. Yeah, I forgot about oh, wow. it until they showed it, and I'm like, oh my god! I mean, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't like keeping it in the back of my mind the whole time I was watching episodes, but I was like, oh fuck, they found it. Yeah, I was like, what? Mm-hmm. That's the ooh. Major props to Sarah for her acting in this scene because when mm. she sees the. Uh, the curse come up on the screen and she's reading it you can just see the look on her face like change like all of the hopefulness and surprise and just just some very subtle sarah is amazing sarah is amazing in both these episodes and i say actually every episode there are very few where i have take issue with sarah's performance she is a consummate professional she goes there she's just solid. And I, I always hate it when people are like, oh, nobody's favorite character on Buffy is ever Buffy. It's always, I was like, I don't know. She's my favorite character. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just. Well, just so people good. always talk about how Allison Hannigan's eyes have her eyes are so big. So she does so much acting with them. But I think Sarah, I actually way more impressed with the way she can act with her eyes. Yeah. I mean, and it's probably mm-hmm. colored by my, like, I don't like Willow that much upon 
several rewatches. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, I was all willow, 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 willow. But um, knowing what you know about what's going to happen, I'm like, I can see all these signs and your manipulation and like Willow's just not my favorite character. And so that the scene with the curse leads into a flashback again, uh, which I'm going to be saying a lot over this episode because this is there's a lot of flashbacks in this episode. This is actually the first time Buffy has done like a flashback uh-huh. episode. Yeah. Well, something that yeah. will come up a lot more. It's more of an angel thing, but they do certainly have flashback episodes on Buffy. Though, for the most part, they're mostly focused on Spike rather than Angel. Yeah, they're about so, the yeah. vampire. Yeah, I mean, you have Fool for Love along with the... Yeah, well, uh, we'll, so, and we'll get We'll there, get... But... Uh, next, next season, we'll have... Oh, what's the um, Christmas episode? Uh, uh, amends. No amends. Uh, we have amends next season, uh, which will be more Angelus history. Yeah. But after that, it does kind of become more of a spike thing. Well, on Because Angel's then. not there anymore. Spikes. So they because Angel's not <laughs> around. Transfer yeah. to the other vampire. Right. And they were also very frequently, that's where they did the crossovers. They did a lot of yeah. flashback uh-huh. crossovers. Yeah. yeah. So. But yes, we see Angel getting his soul. I think that's all I really want to say <laughs> about mean, that. I, because... I'm just assuming that... Yeah. Like, how do they, okay, so my, I was like, well, how do they have the body back for this, like, right? But I'm assuming that Angel, Angelus, sorry, being the murderous evil troll that he is, dumped that body back. Probably. To be like, haha, look what I did. <laughs> yeah. uh, mine is an yeah. evil laugh. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I did notice this is the first time in the flashbacks where he loses the accent, which I find interesting. Because he's he's still got an accent when he turns through when he's uh, withdrew in the confessional. I think he's putting that on but, though. Maybe because but. if you go to look at uh, it, and we'll see this. I'm really gonna have to do the fan out just so we can all see yeah. what Angel's history is like. But I'm pretty right. sure basically as soon as he became Angelus, he kind of dropped the accent. Yeah, because, which I find okay. interesting in this scene because wouldn't you think when he gets his soul back and he's super confused, he'd go back to right. his original accent. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Joss was like, you know uh, what, I mean, I'm done. I mean, it's too much accent. Hopefully he doesn't. <laughs> uh, well, remember in Spin the Bottle when they all lose their memories uh-huh. and they think they're like 16 again? Right. And oh, yeah. he is very confused by the fact that he doesn't have his Irish accent anymore. (laughs) I mean, that was like, that was basically a little fourth wall poking. You know, like, I'm not, we're not having him do the accent again. Not for a whole episode, no. Right, and if he's in London this whole time, why does he end up affecting an American accent? Maybe because he's around Drusilla. Not Drusilla. Maybe because he's around Darla. Darla. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah. Maybe he picks it up from Darla. I'll give you that. Yeah, maybe yeah. he, so he affects trying like, to talk like... imprinted on her. Right. He, well, he tries to talk like... Like a baby duckling. Yes, like a baby duckling. And <laughs> eventually, when you change your voice enough, it just becomes how you yeah. talk. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that happens to me. If I'm in England too long, I start developing a bit of I an pick accent up any to, accent like, of watch, anyone same here. I have to watch it's myself. It's bad. It's, it's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's whatever I, whatever I develop, it's... it's like some kind of English accent that doesn't actually occur in right, nature. Right, yeah, for sure. It's this mis- it's this mishmash of regions and it just like sounds probably sounds terrible and I have to be very careful. That's the Madonna school. I mean, I, the same thing happens to me. It also happens when I'm down south mm-hmm. where I'll suddenly start picking up y'alls and mm-hmm. you know, I, I just some people I think are more susceptible to yeah. some sort of environmental and I'm one of them, and I hate it because, like, when I'm in England, I'll, I mean, I, somebody clocked me for saying tomatoes when we were we were at a B and B, and it was like breakfast, and they like, you know, do you want this or that or the other thing? This is our hostess, you know, and like, you want tomato? And I just said, yeah, grilled tomatoes. And somebody's like, why are you saying grilled tomatoes? Like, it was not something I did. Consciously. I think that was actually was just, me who said that. Well, I think I clocked you. No, I think it was it was Raya. I'm pretty sure it was like Raya gave me that grief, but it was like you were there, and I was just like, I I didn't do it on purpose. I just. You know, she asked me a question, so I responded. Or there's that thing you do, especially amongst actors who took training, like college Mm. training, because their whole point is to make you sound all the same, which like, that's a whole other conversation about the stupidness of that. And then all of a sudden you get drunk. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. Drunk or something or tired Mm -hmm. even. 
and and your natural cadence actually comes out when I start talking like mm-hmm. I'm from the body oh you've seen it happen I'm see yeah you've you've heard it happen when all of a sudden I'm like fucking body oh as fuck <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm drunk, so you know it happens. Anyway, back to the episode. That was a nice tangent, though. I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe he just wanted to sound. I mean, just as another thing, maybe he just wanted to sound more, or he thought he sounded more sophisticated. I mean, we can headcanon it us, any way we want. It's just because David yeah. sucks yeah. at fucking accents. That's pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his accent is it's, it's abysmal. <laughs> and uh, so we get into a very interesting part of the episode where there's. A lot of questionable stuff from different characters because they're talking about whether or not they should do the spell. It's questionable on many different levels because one, Xander's a fucking asshole. Oh yeah, I've never wanted to punch oh, that. Yeah, he's he's in full asshole yeah. mode here. Like, here's my thing. Like, Xander's whole thing is why should we reward Angel with his soul when he's done all of these horrible things? But the thing is. Xander's not the one who's going to go fight Angel. She, he's right. not the one who's going to have to kill him. Mm-hmm. And it's not even a th- matter... Like, I mean, you could bring in the whole Buffy's, you know, mental health and having to kill somebody that she was very close to. But just the physical danger. She, We've already seen her in fights with Angel before. Yeah. And they've always fought to a standstill. Buffy hasn't been able to beat Angel yet. And yeah. so... Like, Buffy's supposed to put herself at risk because you think Angel needs to pay for something. And the yeah. curse is a fucking curse. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and on top of that, considering Angelus is like this murderous, horrible, torturing, sadistic being, if you give him back his soul, you're saving other people's lives. So it's actually, you know, it's not a reward, let's say, for Angel. It's saving everybody else from his no. going on rampages and snapping people's necks and yada you know it's yeah. jenny died because angel didn't have a soul had angel gotten a soul earlier he wouldn't have murdered you know her, so and basically what xander does is what we call it now is he mansplains he mansplains all and he doesn't mm. actually think of anybody but himself his own opinions and his own and i think him bringing up jenny is cruel i'm not saying he's not mourning his teacher i'm not saying that he's not sad oh, yeah, and no, but... all sad and that but bringing her up, oh. he uses it, he weaponizes it, yeah. and he knows it's going to get effect. Because I don't, I don't know what kind of relationship he had with Jenny. I'm sure he thought she was a smoking hot, nice person, but you know, right. he also and disrespected her. Because when did he ever call her Jenny? He always called her right. Miss Callender. Yeah, it's so calculating. And there's something else. I mean, we I, I meant to mention this like when we were recording uh, "Killed by Death," but when um, Xander is actually like in Angel's face, and it's a very like good positive thing. There's there's some you know he's already yeah. threatening Angel. He wants Angel dead, and I think that was also seeding for what we know is going to happen yeah. here. He's just being an absolute dick, and it is like also him being trying to be alpha male in his own like cr- strange Xander way. Even though he can't, it's not, he's not the one who's going to do it, but he's like mouthing off and saying, oh, well, we're going to dig, we're going to deal with you. And it's like, yeah, it's just Xander being a dick And again. the so, look that Giles and, gives him, well, it's, it's like. beautiful, yeah. It's as close to Ripper. I mean, it's, I mean, Giles is not mm. going to, Giles is oh, never. No. Giles, Giles is Giles is never actually going to hurt one of them. I mean, and, and I do, you know, this is a 17 year old boy. A very stupid, very not mature seventeen-year-old boy. So I get like, but he can't see mm-hmm. his way around his own opinion, and he bullies them into doing what he, you know. I just, yeah, I thought Giles was seriously going to knock him over. He was, it was cruel, and it wasn't just cruel towards Buffy. It was, I don't think he intentionally was being cruel towards Giles. He just wasn't thinking about what that was going to do to his friend, his mentor. Giles, you know, he's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, no, it's like it's it's like you said. He is thinking purely about himself, and he is not he's not giving any thought to anything else. Meanwhile, you have Cordelia in the same scene who agrees with Xander, but comes off as much more reasonable. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's very quiet about it and just being like, "I agree with Xander," and then Xander bites her head off because he's not listening to what anybody says. Xander diminishes his girlfriend's opinions 
and their yeah. actual personalities and yeah. ways of being. He's always like, yeah, don't do that. He does it with Anya. So we'll talk about that more. They're he does it with Anya all the time. He's trying to correct time, who yeah. she is mm-hmm. instead yeah. of loving her for who she is. Uh, he does it to Cordy, yeah. too. Uh, there's a, there's yeah. something in the next episode. We'll talk about that then there, too. Yeah, well, Xander always picks girlfriends that he feels are wrong in a, a specific way. They don't conform to what he thinks a person is, and he puts them down for it all the time. And I think a lot of that is symptomatic of the environment in which he is raised, where his parents yeah. criticize each other and say mean, you know, I, I definitely think there's a link there. And we'll get to that when we talk about Anya and as Sander gets older, but... I do see that link. I fucking hate when he does it. And yeah. And you, you need to like deal with your childhood trauma. As Cordy would say, spank your inner mop bit, you know, and move fucking past it and realize <laughs> what you're doing. But, you know. Okay. And so the other problematic thing with this scene, because it's not just Xander being terrible. Willow. Yeah. She- Willow. I Willow thinks she's able to do the spell when Giles can't. Giles has done actual spells. Like, we know we have had instances where Giles has done spells. He summoned Igon. Yeah. Right. But, but you see, unlike Giles, Willow has been researching for the dark fun. arts. For, for fun. For <laughs> You know. Yeah. yeah. On the like, internet. On the internet, And no then less. she has that line. She's like, yeah. oh, no, I really... I." We I could don't possibly want danger. go wrong. She says it. She's like, "No, I don't want danger. Danger's bad." I'm like, "Yeah, you do." She said, "I." Th- she might say it in a later scene, but she says, "I might be the best person to do this." And the only reason why she's the best mm. person to do this is because Giles realizes how dangerous this is, and that he can't do it because of his history. Meanwhile, Willow right. is just like, "I'm gonna do this because I can do whatever I want because I'm Willow." Yeah, for sure. And I think she also doesn't get. She really, as much as she thinks intellectually, maybe she knows the risks. It's one of those teenage things where it's like, oh, nothing's going to happen to me. It's okay. I mean, that is, that is part of it. Like their brains aren't fully formed yet. Then. Yeah. I mean, not that I think she's being smart about it, but I think part of it is unfortunately the, the foolishness of youth where it's always like, oh, I can get away with it because nothing's going to happen to me. Yeah. I mean, part of it might be, you know, the, the foolishness of youth, but this is something that will continue to come up with Willow's character. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's, again, it's an early clue to the new direction with Willow, but I think part of it is naivety and just, you know, that whole belief that you're invincible because you're, you know, 16 years old and whatever, so. Yeah, I mean, there there is definitely part of that, and part of Willow's character, one of her main character traits, is she's so smart. She's so intellectually smart, but she's not very emotionally smart. Like, it's it's IQ, IQ versus EQ. Right, and also on top of that, she's not street smart. She doesn't have, you know, she she is very. There's a lot of naivety because she is like yeah. so intellectual without like life. Yeah, I mean, and so. it, it happens, and and I don't yeah. see her grow from it much through the course of seven seasons. No. Uh, at least I see some growth in Xander later on. Yeah, so yeah, she's always arrogant, mm-hmm. no matter yeah. what. Like, I mean, they always might talk about Willow being, you know, a little mouse or whatever, but no, actually she's incredibly arrogant in everything. And she never has anybody tell her no. And like, in by season seven, they do call her like the most powerful witch ever. And I don't think that Willow is she's the not. most powerful witch ever. I think she's just the most uncontrollable witch ever. Because there are people who can do things that Willow can't. It's just they won't. Yeah. Which Giles clocks right. her on in Flooded. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, and, and Tara, that's the reason Tara leaves her. Rightfully yeah. so. Because right. she's reckless. She yeah. is. She doesn't grow. I mean, I and, I and there are many times that I love Willow. And there are many times that Willow and Buffy have these wonderful conversations. And they do love each other so much. But, and, and, and a lot of this is coming from us being adults. Like, I was all for Willow yes. doing the spell, and I didn't realize what an asshole oh, yeah. Sander was the first time I watched this. I wanted Angel to have his soul back. Not because yeah. I was in totally in love with the bangle thing, but, I, I mean, it, I, what was presented in front of me, it was super invested, you know? I wanted him to get his yeah. soul back, and I wanted it to ha- she didn't have to kill it. You know, I, I wanted those things, so I wanted Willow to succeed. But uh, moving on to the next scene, we have uh, Angel and Drusilla killing the archaeologist. 
Drew, save me some. Ugh. I love Angela <laughs> so much. And Drew, I love him. I, really I want to know, like, I wanted a like a yeah. bottle episode. It was just the three of them living in the Crawford Street mansion, like, and what they actually, because, you know, we see the, because this is plot driven and we don't have time for that shit. I get that. Yeah. We only see them talking about things relevant to the plot, but I just wanted a bottle episode where they just like spikes bitching and he wheels into the other room and then Drew sneaks off and has sex with Angel. You know what I mean? Like, I just want, I just want to know what they do with that mansion together. I, I think it's a lot of Angel and Spike fighting and Drusilla trying to lure them into a three-way. For sure. Yeah. And if yeah. I was Drusilla, I probably would too. Because <laughs> as we discussed, yeah. As we discussed, this is peak David Boreanaz hotness time. And James Marsters at the time, yeah. I was all about Spike. Yeah. So I, if I were Drusilla, I'd be trying to do the same thing. I mean, come on. Uh, just going on to the next scene with uh, Buffy talking to Willow on the phone. I was never a huge fan of Buffy and Angel, but I totally get why Buffy is feeling oh, this way. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Her love for, for Angel and wanting to have Angel back. It's, I mean, at the time, I might have been a bit more on Xander's side, but now, like, with the the benefit of being all grown up i'm like no i get it from from buffy's side where it's like how hard that would be and yeah so and it's really sad and you have the beautiful music i have so many notes i've just threw out my notes it's like christoph 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 it is his scores for these episodes especially these big ones i'm gonna go on a limb and say better than better than most scores on tv you know what i mean it's like it's the Emmys yeah. agreed. This episode won the Emmy for Outstanding Music Composition yeah, for a series. Yeah, it's so cinematic. And I know it you have beautiful. a lot yeah. less time on a TV series. And you don't have an orchestra. This was all done through, like, manipulation on a keyboard. You know, that this wasn't... You didn't go in a studio and record this with a bunch of musicians. Yeah. But it's, it's yeah. brilliant. Christoph Beck's work is fucking brilliant. Yes, it is. And uh, Buffy goes out uh, slaying, and she runs into Kendra. Kendra is dressed much more appropriately to be a slayer. Oh, yeah. I was, like, so proud. And I was kind of laughing because it was, like, we were talking, like, you know, about a couple weeks ago about, like, Jenny's outfit being so 90s. I think Kendra's outfit is very 90s, too, in terms of, like, the, the chunky shoes and the kind of, like, menswear, like, the, the, the heavier pants and all that. And I, it's so much more appropriate than what she was wearing when she first showed up. I was, like, so happy to see her. It's basically Buffy's outfit from The Wish. I mean, that's basically what it is. It is, yeah. Yeah. Though, I mean, there's still a couple things I clocked her for. Like, she's wearing dangly earrings, and that hair is pretty damn long. Like I've said, like I've said, it denotes otherness. We talked about this in What's My Line Part 1 and 2. Chunky earrings, that kind of hair. It's a way, and a gross way, for them to denote otherness and her blackness. And we won't go through that all again, because we did that on What's My Line, but... Yes, because we did we like did, an hour and of that's that. Fine, yeah. But that's I'm yeah. just yeah. go go back to those. I'm just reiterating. Go back to those episodes and listen to us rant there. But uh, she basically tells Buffy that there's a dark power a rising dark in Sunnydale, power. and when when yeah, isn't there like, a dark power rising in I know, Sunnydale? Right? And it's like oh oh oh, it must be Tuesday. She had to come all the way from the islands just to tell Buffy this and thing be that martyred. She have known otherwise. To be yeah. fair, it does seem like this whole Akapa thing is like a predestination yeah. thing because like the whole thing with Whistler is all very confusing, but it seems like yeah. Whistler bringing Angel to Sunnydale to begin with was all part of this Akapa yeah. thing because that's why Whistler right. shows up at the end. Yeah, this does seem like a pretty big predestination thing, which is probably tied with the whole becoming thing. And, uh, but we see Angel not helping out with a Catholic, but, you know, bringing him yep. to the Crawford Street mansion and Spike's, mm-hmm. it's a big rock. I can't wait to tell I, my friends. I think that, that, is rock my, is big. that is one of my favorite lines in the entire series. That, that just like his delivery is like, it's a big rock. Can't wait to tell my friends. They don't have a rock this <laughs> big. And of, course, later, and of course, later he gets to say wackiness ensues, yeah. which... <laughs> Is just something I say all the time. What's Angel's fucking motivation? Like, and I don't think this is a problem with Angel, Angelus himself, or the way David plays it. I, 
It's a problem yeah, with a the problem writing. With Joss's writing. There is no motivation for why he wants to end the world. Like none. It is completely unmotivated. Right. Yeah. It's like what. My note actually says, what's your motivation? Oh, wait, Joss didn't give you one. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I think Angelus, I don't have a problem with him being so evil that he wants to go to a Mm. demon dimension. Because we actually don't know anything about this demon dimension. And actually, I've come up with a headcanon for it. Which, I don't know if I want to get into it now or I should get into it in part two. Should I just get into it now? Sure. Sure. So my head can't, and I mean, it actually ties into the next scene because Giles gets into the exposition about what a Catholic will do. And that's, it'll open up a portal to a demon dimension. And this is the first time we hear about demon dimensions, which is something that will become a major plot point over Buffy and Angel and uh, the Buffy comics. And Mm -hmm. so we're told... This is called, it's called hell, and it's just basic, your basic hell, and they don't really get into any of the details of it, but we do know that it's completely uh, a dark dimension, and that Angel is tortured there for hundreds of years, like, we don't know how long he was tortured there, but that time moves differently there. So, my headcanon, this demon dimension is the Kortoth. Oh, you are so interesting, and I love you. (laughs) <laughs> because the court the courtoth is the darkest of the demon dimensions oh. like they're always talking about that on angel that it is the worst of the worst demon dimensions and not only that is there are no traditional portals to this dimension it can only be opened by like demons who are like have like the ability to do that and a katha seems to be a very powerful demon that could probably tear a hole in t- in the fabric of time and space to open up a portal to Kortoth. so i think that angel was actually tortured in the court for like a hundred years listeners go feral this is with- why mc is my bff <laughs> because we have often had these conversations <laughs> in person just for fun um, so I just want to shout out that is a freaking amazing headcanon. And that is why you are my beautiful. Oh, thank you. But I think that if if you think about it as this demon dimension isn't just hell, it's the Kortoth, which is like a basically it's a world just like ours. It just happens to be filled mm-hmm. with demons. Then it does kind of make sense that Angel would want to pull uh the world into there because you <laughs> It bas- it doesn't suggest that actually that humans are going to immediately die upon going into this dimension. They're just going to be stuck into this in this dimension where demons rule, rather than possibly mm-hmm. a dimension of darkness where you know there's no sunlight and then vampires can hunt all the time. We don't know any details about it, but it's possible that Ange- Angelus just wants to get to a place where he doesn't have to he can revel in his evilness. He's basically a Bond villain in these episodes with his motivation. His motive well, yes. is about as motivated yeah. as a Bond villain. Well, yeah. And actually sometimes less. Which is, I love your headcanon and I think it's brilliant. I also think Joss dropped the ball on any fucking motivation. Like, Oh yeah. Oh, we're yeah. better about yeah, writing just, that stuff than Joss is because he just was like, Angel's evil Porto to hell it, you know, a Catholic is really the... Is it mm-hmm. a MacGuffin, David? Are you going to correct me one way or another? On that? Uh, it's a little MacGuffin. Yeah, kind okay, of is MacGuffin. You. I yeah. wanted to check that through with David. Yeah, yeah. He's the yeah. MacGuffin detector. <laughs> there could also be an element of... And, and I mean, again, this is me speculating on Angel's motivations, because yes, Joss doesn't write this in. But Angel... Angelus wants to do it because it's something that would hurt Buffy and it's something that would hurt Angel. Because that seems to be everything that Angelus does, seems to be to destroy the humanity. That's that true. Angel I, I get part of that. But there's also yes. a line where she comes yeah. in, it's in the next episode where he's like, I don't have time for you. I'm doing this instead. So I, we'll talk about it in the next episode. But yes, just to move on. So yeah, we do talk about demon dimensions a little bit and then. Uh, Willow talks about how she thinks she can do the spell, but she needs an orb of Thessala, but <laughs> thankfully Giles boy. has one. Oh. Yeah. And this is one of my favorite brick jokes of all time, because it was a, m- mentioned as just a random joke in Passion, so like five episodes ago or something. Yeah, I, I love that little callback. I just yeah. Right, so where the guy called it a new age paperweight, yeah. and Giles, that 
Giles is actually using it as a paperweight. I mean, but at least he knows what it is. Like, it's just not some new ager with the funny crystal ball. I mean, he's like, well, I didn't really have any use for it, but I've got it around, so I might as well use it as a paperweight. See, that's the thing. It's like, that's the impression I get, is the Oren Thessala, it's one of these things, like, yeah, it has this one use. Other than that, it's good as a paperweight. Yeah. Other, yeah, like, it's just basically 99% <laughs> of the time, that's all it's good for. <laughs> yeah, I think Giles went and bought something at the Magic box for yes. a, a spell so like when when they uh were fighting uh, against uh what's it uh amy's mom and he was yeah. just upsold. or it's like a freebie with yeah. like he's like hey with we're gonna purchase. throw this in for yeah. Yeah. It's a... with a purchase of 90 dollars, we will oh. give you an orb of thessala <laughs> now one thing that confuses me since we were talking about motivations but spike so i mean i get and we'll get into this more in the next episode but mm. In this episode, An- Angelus tries to do the ritual to uh, bring forth a Cathla, and it doesn't work. But we hear in the next episode how Spike doesn't want to be sucked into a demon dimension. He likes yeah. things the way they are. So mm-hmm. w- Spike doesn't know it's going to fail, so why is he just sitting there? I don't know, because Spike has... I don't... Uh... Well... Is he Spike? I. He's... Well, I mean... I mean, this is jumping ahead to the next episode again, but Spike will be the one who who gives the method for them finding out how to actually get the ritual to work. That's true. Which which makes even less sense to me, given that in the next episode we'll have Spike's whole speech. Spike may not have come to the... I mean, obviously he doesn't want the world to end, but like... Spike is smart in many, many ways that we're going to see, but in other ways he's like... Spike is reactive at this point. He's not super proactive. Yeah. He's reactive. Mm-hmm. Um, and he flips back and forth from yeah. that. But like when he's around Angel, I'm sorry, Angela specifically, and pissed off, he's working on pure reactiveness and not a lot of... And then so he thinks about it and then proactively decides to try to team up with Buffy. So, you know, Spike is a creature of a lot mm-hmm. of emotional up and down. So I... My answer to that is because it's Spike and... He's inconsistent, but he's inconsistent in a way that sort of works. In a way that you humans are inconsistent, you know? Maybe he thought Angelus wasn't going to do it up until True. the moment yeah. he tried. And he's yeah. like, oh, oh shit, he's, gonna he's do actually yeah, going to do this. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And at yeah. that point, there's nothing right. nothing he can do. Yeah. Right. Only hope that it's not going to work because... I mean, maybe he just assumes it's not going to work because Angelus is not as, you know, confident yeah. as he thinks he is. While Angelus is doing the ritual, and he's like, I shall become... Then we get a flashback to Manhattan in 1996, and we see our first shot of homeless... I know, that is such a bad costuming. Yeah. I mean, it's just like... It's just... Oh, let's God. rub dirt oh, yeah. in it. The, I, yeah. And I love, I love Whistler, and I know one of the original plans for Angel is to try to get him back. Instead of Joy. Yes, I believe yeah. actually, I believe actually, like the first draft, it was Whistler had instead of Doyle. Whistler in there. But then uh, Match Perlick mm-hmm. was, I think he was on another show, so they couldn't. Mm-hmm. Max Perlick has been in everything forever. He's he's a total that guy, yeah. which is great. Yeah. I mean, he's had a really long yeah. career with some really interesting roles, mm-hmm. which is the career I would have wanted if I kept acting. I didn't want to be Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie. I wanted to be Matt. Perlich or like or Mark Shepard uh, Mark Shepard or um Margo um the Americans Mar- Margo Martindale yeah Martindale um so that's who I wanted to be I didn't I didn't want yeah you know I wanted a career like that and I'm gonna have my production rant now what the hell part of Manhattan is that supposed to be it's the back lot the MGM back lot part it does not exist but of course, yeah, of course. it's, it's yeah. what someone from LA thinks New York is like it yeah. is like like you hit there in fact in one of the in one of the interviews Joss had does on the DVD he talks yeah we got the Sabrett's hot dog so it's guy so it's just right and I'm like no oh, and, and of course because it's Manhattan it's like of course there is a porn shop and a pawn shop right next to each other. <laughs> right. And it's funny because <laughs> Joss is born in New York. Yeah. yeah. He obviously wasn't paying attention. I, cause... Yeah. Is this, I get the feeling it was supposed to be fake downtown. Uh, I was like, no. It's, just it's like, <laughs> that, that simply is not Manhattan in 1996. 
or any yeah. other time, really. It's like somebody's like fever dream of Times Square circa yeah. 1984, maybe. But yeah, uh, uh. and even then, it's wrong because you don't have stoops and stuff. No, it's but, it's just all yeah. wrong. It is very clear that uh, Doyle was supposed to be Whistler because if you look at Whistler in the scene and you look at Doyle oh, in yeah. the first mm-hmm. episode of Angel, I mean, like the oh, yeah. hat is exactly yeah, the same. Sure. Basically, Whistler's speech to uh, Whistler's speech to Angel is basically the same speech Doyle will give to Angel in that pilot episode so yeah yeah i was like thinking like is there an entire clan of you know and i'm not even that cognizant of of angel yet but like immediately is there like an entire clan of demons that are just like doyle and whistler because yeah, well doyle just... and whistler are different types of demons uh doyle's right. a bracken demon and whistler i, I can i don't know if says, look it up to yeah. see what type of demon he but doyle's only ha- doyle's only half demon isn't he Doyle is yeah. half demon. He is half Bracken demon and half human. And meanwhile, uh, Whistler is actually, uh, he is half uh, demon and half power that be. Oh, uh, cool. Oh. Okay. He just happens to take human form. This is something that's not revealed until right. the comics. And, they, and actually we will find out in the comics of- that ah. Whistler. Whistler, yeah, Whistler is not Benevolent? as... Um, benevolent as he appears in this yeah but i mean like uh just based off of this episode this is the first time we actually see a benevolent True, demon. yeah yes and we won't yeah. see a lot of them on buffy yeah, until you uh, get clem yeah and You're yeah right. and clem is even kind of like a weird case because like clem just happens to be a good guy but I mean, like he, it does still eat. Which kittens. is not. I mean, that's. Not, I mean, yes, and... kittens are the most important animal in the entire universe. But in terms of evil, <laughs> bad things, eating kittens is not. I mean, I mean, it's gross. We don't like it. But like, different cultures have different eating habits, and let you know. True enough. Um, but in yeah. terms of like actual evilness, like mm-hmm. Clem's like whatever. He's just got floppy skin. And, and yeah, basically, uh, Clem's about it. And it's not until we get over onto Angel where it's... And, and I think that was an important thing for them to do. Because, I mean, Buffy. It's called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Her whole thing is killing demons. So having it is. good it does demons kind of makes it hard. Meanwhile, when you go on to Angel and the main character is a good demon. Right, I mean, um, Anya's the other one where you get some of that, too. But um, she's former. Anyway... They go to Los Angeles in 1996, and oh my, oh god, my god, Angel is creepy jo- as fuck. Joss is creepy as fuck. Oh yes! The lollipop, that scene is shot 100% disgusting male gaze. It's fucking disgusting. Yeah. That is like to- the things I don't like about Joss that everybody oh, is always like. We're not even going to get into that. that. It's like that. And also, later on when we get to scenes in the back of ice cream vans, no, it's just like. You know, creepy dudes wet dream and stop it. Yes. Yeah. But Buff Buffy's supposed to be fifteen in this scene. Yeah. She mm-hmm. is fifteen and she's made up to look at. She's got the fucking lollipop and she's they've made her all fresh faced. Meanwhile, Angel in the episode Earshot says that he fell in love with Buffy in this moment. It's disgusting. Yeah. He is a lo- like I mean, like even discounting the whole vampire, like several hundred years old he's 26 so here's the thing that i came to the realization during this episode angel doesn't really see buffy buffy is a symbol for him a symbol of purity and redemption um but redemption comes with hard work like on the show on buffy i'm not talking about angel the show angel yet he doesn't really do that much good He's like Mr. Scared Guy that doesn't want to get involved in the first season. And he only does the big heroic things for Buffy or if Buffy tells him to do it. Does that is am I making sense? Like, yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Like he provides a couple books for Giles. He's not actually good at what he does. He's just really needy at this point. And I get it. This is his first time, like, interacting with humans, you know, but um Again, he's not proactive; he's reactive, and it, it yeah, it's just it's just about hit. She is a symbol for him, and I think she stays a symbol for him for the rest of his freaking existence. And it's not actually about Buffy, her personality, who she is. She's just a symbol. 
everything that Angel does on Buffy is for the love of Buffy and the healthiness of their relationship is always put into question. And when we see him going over onto his own show, for the first episode, he's not He's not trying to do anything to help anyone. He's trying to stay out of people's way. And Doyle points out, it's like, you know, you can't do this. Like, if you if you do this, if you're just, you know, kind of hiding in the shadows, you know, helping people randomly, one of these days, you're going to eat one of them because, you know, what difference does it make? And so it's not until we get on to Angel that he actually goes on to his redemptive path and he finds out that, oh, yeah, I am going to be a champion for good. And arguably, and I'm, I could get a lot of people fighting with me on this, arguably does more on a cosmic scale scale for good and evil than Buffy does. I'm not going to get into that. I mean... Because they deal... Well, they deal a lot... I think that's because they deal a lot more with the cosmic aspect of good versus yeah, evil Yeah, I also Angel. think of Buffy, it's a lot of it is metaphors for different stages in your life as opposed to Angel, which is like a metaphor for other things, especially found family. I mean, Joss's thing is always found family. But Angel, I think that really sticks the landing there because there are no parents anywhere because they're adults. So I would say, you know, I, I don't really have an opinion on who does the most and I'm not going to fight you on it. It's, it, it, Buffy is a much more yes. um, intimate mm-hmm. show in terms of, uh, and meanwhile, uh, Angel does, uh, just the fact that, that they have, you know, a running bad guy that goes over the course of the entire show. That is true. That is very, very true. It's actually, it's interesting. It's like, it seems I, I can see a parallel between this and and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've got the movies, which are more often more on the cosmic scale. Yeah. And then you have the yeah, Netflix yeah. shows, which are all based in Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like it's it's a more Buffy is a more local show. Well, I mean, LA is a huge freaking <laughs> yeah. city. So I mean, if there you've got more scope, even just right. within being in LA, even without the, it's like bigger. Even without the cosmic stuff, it's just a larger. Yeah, and I mean, what only like one episode of Buffy takes place outside of Sunnydale. It's mm. only like right, and that and is, is in LA, mostly yeah. taking yeah. place outside. Yeah. But just moving on from uh, fucking this fuck creepy ass scene with uh, yeah. yes, and I blame I do not. Super, I mean, super that super is creepy. all writing, and that is all this like forbidden love nonsense yeah no sarah does a really good job of playing like ditzy like clueless buffy and i like her but the rest of it is just like she plays cordelia she is but a a kind of less biting version of cordelia i've always said that she's like i was very cordelia and i'm like i don't see that for me she was remindful of uh, alicia silverstone in clueless here oh yeah for sure not as and sharing clueless is actually really she does some dumb stuff, but she she's doing it because she likes people. So, you know, she's it's yeah, it's it's Emma. She's Emma from. Yeah. Anyway, um, I do have to wonder, um, how long did Buff? How long did Angel stalk Buffy before he uh, revealed himself to her? And and, the, and too long. Way too long. Because this is set a year before Welcome to the Hellmouth. So mm-hmm. did he just right. watch her creepily or did he go and set himself up in Sunnydale knowing that she'd come there? I'm betting that he watched her creepily for a year. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think there was some setup because Whistler is definitely there to push him towards Sunnydale to stop a Cathla. I also love that line that he tells Whistler and it's, it, it's Angel. It's the Angel we'll see later. And he's like, I want to help, but I don't want to dress like you. Yeah, that is, that's very much a... It's a very angel, and and David, perfection with the... He, he's so funny. Angel is so funny, and he doesn't get to be funny until later. Is, right yeah. now, it's just this, like, creeper freaking dude. And we go back to the present day, uh, and Angel's not able to uh, summon a Cathola. And then Spike is brilliant again with oh, someone he, wasn't he worthy. At this point, I was just like, I love that guy. He does. He does get a lot of the best lines. He does. Yeah. Point. yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, at this point, like I loved Spike before this. Like I loved him from Home Sweet Home, but this is where my love of Spike yeah. is really kind of cemented because we're starting to get the Spike that we will see through season four i and think five. at this point my lust mm-hmm. for spike 
turned into my absolute delight. My less for Spike, <laughs> a.k.a. James Marsters, because I'm sorry, he's just, he's not my type. He's really hot in this, yeah. Uh, he's, he's very much, yeah, something, you know, hey. But yeah, then it turned to this, like, no, no, Spike is really, I write, you know, I, I, yeah. I do have to wonder, how does somebody like Angelus convince a vampire to go kamikaze for them? I have no idea. Like, I can understand if it was the master. And and somebody did that because the master had a very cult like. Do you think Drusilla did the be in my eyes thing? <laughs> yeah, just just for our listeners, uh, Andy is actually doing the Drusilla uh, look in my eyes thing. I I I I talk with my hands, and that's the one thing that the listeners can't see is that you the other three or when Logan's here, four of you are sitting there. And you're listening and you're doing your thing. And Andy's sitting on the, making these giant broad gestures um, constantly, constantly. <laughs> it's like I'm acting out the episode as I'm sitting here. Yeah, I have seen the theory that maybe Drusilla hypnotized the vampire. Uh, but yeah, that's the only explanation I can, I can see. Because, I mean, Spike mentions in season three that he hires his minions. Yeah, it's the difference between the... Right. The so. management styles of Angel- Angelus and Spike. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it just seems like if you were going to be hiring a vampire, that you wouldn't be able to like hire one. Right, and it's to yeah, kill yeah, with the master, absolutely. Mm. With just Angelus the cruel, like uh, anyway. Yeah. The- like I mean, how are you, how are you supposed to get somebody to kill themselves? Where it's like, if you don't kill yourself, I'm going to kill you. And then the vampire's like, run right. away, run away. Yeah, and it's not like there's, like, some actual real reason, like, oh, if I die, you know, I'm going to, like, ascend to heaven or to hell. And, you know, it's not like certain, like, like suicide bomb or something like that where they actually have some fervent reason it's a to want to die. It's just so a big fucking bottle. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. Though it's a, it's a lovely, I love this scene, It is creepy scene, AF. I mean, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Yeah, it is creepy AF, but, like, I, you know, I'm just going to go with Drew and the, I'm going to do it to you right now, I'm saying be in me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you you don't want to get into this ad. Listeners, download and review on iTunes. Listeners, be in my eyes. Download and review on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. I do love that like everybody in class is like running away and Buffy is just it's like what there, else? just cool yeah. just like okay that happened. Oh, oh, yeah. vampire burning up. Yeah. Fun fact, that stunt woman who did the immolationogram is named Cindy Fokerson and she has been set on fire more times than any other stunt woman in Hollywood. Nice. Well, there you go. That's a that great fun fact. I love it. Yay. Wow. Yeah. Here we see Buffy making the same mistake she made back and when she was bad. She's like, I'm going to go yeah. run off after Angel. And you guys stay here in the library. I have a little trouble calling it a mistake. I mean, she has a reason for doing it. And, and it's a legitimate reason. Because she can't, I mean, she can't risk Angel killing more people. And she did leave Kendra there. She left another Slayer there for backup and protection. I mean, it doesn't work out, but... She did. Well, I mean, it is a mistake in that it was the wrong thing to do. And I mean, like, Angel even calls her out for her, you know, following every single the same time. Trick every single time. Well, yeah, but, but it's essentially, it's a forced error. I mean, it's, you know, she doesn't really have a choice. Huh. So we keep on talking about how much we love Buffy's coats, but I love this blue coat. <laughs> I was gonna. My note says, "Hey, David, what are your thoughts on Buffy's coat?" <laughs> like I specifically wrote wrote David in my notes because I wanted to know David's opinion. Buffy, Buffy has great coats. What can I say? He, she's yes. Oh, she's 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 a very fashionable young lady. Yeah. I also love that it's a bright colored coat. It real. It may, first of all, it makes it stand out. It is very fashionable for the time too. But it also makes her a beacon of light and all the darkness. It's very purposeful. Um, I also wanted that coat so freaking bad. It is really freaking cute. Yeah. It's a good Oh, one. yeah. It, now, David, in your opinion, 
what is your ranking between this coat and the raincoat? Like, <laughs> uh, we want to know. Uh, I have. I haven't really. Hmm. I don't, I really like the raincoat. This is okay. actually. This is a very different coat, though. It's um. This is a very. Okay. I I like this coat. It's a good coat. Oh, Andy, you weren't here last week when we talked about it, but the raincoat turned up in Go Fish. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, I'll 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 go back and look for it. So. Nice. Good. We got another raincoat discussion. I look forward to listening to the episode that I missed. And uh, <laughs> we get our first appearance of, by Mr. Pointy. Yay! Uh, Mr. Pointy! And oh man, Kendra's just so lonely and has nothing in her life but I know. being a slayer. I also do love Buffy's yeah. Al Franken line. Which in the light of the world, now I'm like, I love that line, except that <laughs> yes. I don't follow Al, Al Franken. But well, yeah. Was he a senator by this point? Or was no? He was still on. Oh no! Was, no, he no, was no, just no. a he was writer on SNL. Okay, so he was a writer I, I and producer love, on Saturday Night Live. I love it when Buffy calls point. things pop yeah. culture things into the name of the like how she'll call the Churricons the Shakacons. Oh, yeah. Like yes. later on, so I just, I just love <laughs> yes. That. And yeah. er, earlier in this episode, yeah. she refers alfalfa, to the Catholic as alfalfa. Yeah, several yeah. different things. So, um, yeah, Kendra. Yeah. That's all she has. That's all she knows, and it. And it pisses me off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, let's bring her in. She gives Buffy this important sword. And that's her only purpose. Her purpose is to come in, mm -hmm. give her the sword, and die. Because God... So let's kill her off so we can... Let's kill her off so we can get a whiter, more sassy American slayer. Also, probably Bianca Lawson has a busy schedule and that might have had something to do with it. Like, I get that part of the rationale yeah. is, could we get her back? We can't, so we're gonna kill her and bring on someone that we can have as recurring. But, but it pisses me off. Yeah, it it also really bothered me that she like fell for Drew's thing so easily. Like she doesn't even resist. Like yeah. she's a slayer, wasn't she? Like trained. You know, wouldn't she know that they use mesmerism or whatever? Like no. I point of order. Buffy fell for it twice. Yeah. Okay, because I mean, being hypno she was hypnotized by. Uh, Lothos in the movie, which granted isn't canon, but Buffy was killed by the master by being hypnotized by him. And she's gonna, and it's gonna happen with uh, Dracula. Vampire thrall is a thing. Okay. All right. Buffy and Kendra, why can't you see the vampires here gonna hypnotize me? Sorry, I had to do a little like notorious B.I.G. there. It's okay. But it's still Kendra and it's still shitty because it's we, you know, that they, they just offer so easily. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I did notice, and this is a, I don't know if, I mean, I, I guess it's both writing and directing since Joss did both, but the little bit of business where Kendra's fighting and she goes to grab Mr. Pointy and realizes that she's already given it to Buffy so she doesn't have mm. the stake on her. Well, oh, I've never noticed that. Good, good catch. I only noticed that today. Okay, good on you. Okay. That is probably a very conscious mm -hmm. choice. Like I said, Joss isn't a brilliant visual director. He never will be. But at this point, he's still, but that, that sounds like a very meaningful. He's a, he's a writer's director. And he's an actor's director. He does work with actors to get good performances, but visually he's not, uh, he ain't all that. He, he's, he's, he's not a visual director. He's a storyteller. He's interested in getting the story across he is and that, that yeah for sure and he gets better at his visuals as time goes on for sure but he's a he's a character he likes the story he likes this so um yeah i'm not all like I, I i don't hate the direction of this episode i just think it's not oh no i mean i i don't hate it either compared to some of our experienced directors that they're getting from the outside and bringing in and uh, Michael Gershman, it's just not the same level of... Yeah, and I mean, I'm not saying... I mean, not every director has to be an right, for sure. visual director anyways. I mean, there's always... Right. Everybody brings different stuff to the party. And I... If it comes down to having something that's really beautiful but doesn't have any, you know, layers to it or having something that really focuses on the story and maybe doesn't look as great i'm gonna take whatever the one that you know really conveys the story no no i'm gonna i'm gonna take the thing with the stories and the characters any day i'm just pointing out he's a novice at this point and so it's not yeah 
Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's mm-hmm. solid. It's solid television directing. So. Well, I think this is only probably like his fourth or fifth directing outing. So. Well, he directed Prophecy Girl and when she was bad. I believe when she was bad. And did he possibly do? I don't know. I'll have to look it up. But this is third or fourth time he's directed. So, yeah. He did the. Oh, he did. Uh... Which one? Did he do that one? Uh, it says he. It says he did Welcome to the Hellmouth uncredited, but I don't really believe that. Uh, uh he didn't. He didn't. Um. Oh, he did. He did reshoots later, so maybe he directed some of those ones. You know where Giles and Buffy and the tone wasn't right, but he didn't direct the whole episode. Now, this is his fifth one because he also did Lie to Me and Innocence. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, gotcha. There we are. So yeah, his fifth episode. So it's he he he's he's still, you know, very he's a still a newbie. Yeah, he's learning. I'm not again, I'm not criticizing the direction. I'm just Oh yeah. No, no, I get it. What do I know? Mm. I can't direct him. And, and he and he has a lot of a lot of other stuff on his plate, too. Right. The writing, the overseeing, the yeah, it's totally fine. And I mean, like this end bit is really like the the fight iconic. The run down the hall is iconic. Well, I mean, even before we get to that, when it's just the when it's the fight, um, every there is a lot of shit going on in this scene, mm. and I think they actually handle it really well. Willow getting crushed by the bookcase yeah. freaks me the fuck out. It, me too. And I have a shitty winter book or bookcase that would fall down on me at any moment. Really. Not as heavy, it's wicker, so it'd probably be okay, but, you know. And, and what one yeah. of the nice Xander bits of this episode, where he's protecting Cordelia and getting her to run away. Yes, uh-huh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And his first major injury. Yeah. And his first major injury, yeah. Yeah. We'll be seeing more major injuries as he, as time goes on, but... <laughs> and then we get... Uh, the, but then the fight starts to fall apart yeah. when we get into Kendra and Drusilla fighting, because it's... Yeah. It's it's yeah. pretty weak sauce. The stunt match isn't great, and the it is pre- it is. It's like they're like they they wanted the actresses to sort of do more of it instead of having to cast extra. Di- I don't know what it is. It's it's weak sauce. And I mean, and for the most part, it's a it's a lot of them just moving around and just kind of putting their arms up. Right, and we know that Kendra's a better fighter than that. We've seen it before. She's a better fighter than this. Yeah, uh, apparently. Juliet said at a convention that uh, her fake nails kept on falling off when. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to film the, the throat slashing scene many times because oh. she kept on like trying to like do the the slashing and the nail would just pop off. It's falling out. Yeah. God. I was gonna say I made a note that I really liked her. I, I get you can't call it a French manicure because it's like red and white, not like beige and white. But I really like the manicure. Some mud, I love. Oh, please, I love that. I've done that manicure so many times. I I always yeah. called them goth, tips. but I like that it's red and white and not red yeah. and black. Yeah, which would be super obvious phrase. because that makes a better yeah. line. Yeah, across I'm, the right. If it had been black and white tips, it's a it's yeah. it's a contrast. Yeah, visually, that's the nice visual. And blood and instead of just white, red and black. Yeah, which I've also done right. a million times. But yeah, yeah, I just thought that was design wise, they looked really nice. Though. In fact, I think I'm going to go get my nails done next week and I'm going to yeah. have them Drusilla yeah. them. I just cut off all of my cool. nails and I'm really sad that I did. Yeah. Like, damn, I should have done goth tips. Ugh. But then, oh, the ending of this. Oh, the ending. It's. It is. It is iconic. Like, I mean, they will use it in the opening credits. I know. And it's just. <sighs> it's like in that moment, what Buffy is losing and lost and what she's trying to save and doesn't know. Again, Sarah's fucking face. Whistler is just really... Yeah, and the voiceover from Whistler is really good, and the way the coat moves, and... It is a good coat for movement. Yeah. yeah. Just... It's, it, that is a yeah. lovely shot. That is... Yeah, yeah no, just... And the, and the, and the cliffhanger yeah. is like, whoa! Yeah, it's, it's like... There's this very dreamlike quality while she's running in slow mo, and then you have this uh, narration over top, and then it just suddenly flips with that freeze. And yeah, yeah no, it works really well. And and when you and when this first aired, 
oh my god it was like what there was buzz and and for those of us that weren't even on the internet at that point talking about buffy it was like what is going to happen i need to know what is going to happen and i didn't for three months we'll talk i'll maybe tell that story in the next episode so yeah so it's really hard to talk like to wrap up this episode because it's so tied just to to part two but i think that this i think it's really strong it is really strong and it's an amazing cliffhanger like yeah. and, and a real cliffhanger not just like a manufactured yeah. bullshit like you know telenovela <laughs> a mm-hmm. cliffhanger which i do love and has their place in my life but in this case oh god i wanted to know so bad what was gonna happen yeah i think i mean we've complained about a lot of the episodes this season and i feel like this season has more uh two-parters than any other season and i think and i think that might be one of the reasons why there's some really like shoddy one shots in this because they were saving up all of their good stuff for the two parters. And this definitely, it's like, of course they have an episode like go fish right before this, because they were focusing on everything on getting becoming out. And I'm sure they were double banking and there was so much stuff going on there that, yeah, they, no, it's, it is. It's as we were saying last week that they probably just, there were things that were like, okay, we have to do something for filler, right? Let's take that fish one. And, Stick it in here, so. I think this episode's mostly filler. I feel like singing today, apparently. Okay, Mm. so uh, anybody have any final thoughts on Becoming Part 1? I'm still pissed off with what they do to Kendra, but other than that, I'm... Yeah. Yeah, well... I'm pissed off about the Manhattan set, so... (laughs) (laughs) I was uh, very unhappy about Kendra and... I didn't, I was just like, I'm so used to like seeing bad Manhattan in TV like and movies and stuff that I kind of just like, yeah. that like I said, cause it's the MGM back, back lot oh, yeah. type thing. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm just annoyed because in the interview, Joss talks about how they, you know, they got the hot dog guy to get it just right. And I'm like, you didn't get it even vaguely right. I'm like, ah, I, I, I'm one of like the few natives of Manhattan. So I. I take this a bit to heart. So, yeah. Uh, screw you, Joss. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's it's a great. It's it's great. And in tandem with the next episode when you watch them together, it's it's just such a great full picture. So, yeah. And we yeah, will be no. getting into that next week. So, uh, for music this episode, we didn't have any bands playing, but we had so much from Christoph Beck. Oh, gorgeous and oh my god did he he deserved that emmy because he did oh absolutely he did as angel becomes cursed devil's child massacre and show me your world so and they are if you do not have the buffy soundtrack and i'm talking like the original score soundtrack which i will find out the exact name of it might just be the buffy soundtrack but. It's great, and then at, on the on the once more with feeling soundtrack, they do. There's the the suite. They do the hush suite, and then the close your eyes, and the, it's so yeah. good. Yeah. So, and we'll get close your eyes next episode. Yeah, the Buffy. Yeah, Christoph Beck's Buffy soundtrack. It's called mm-hmm. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The score, and it has I believe like 29 tracks on it it's all the i've used it as transition music between scenes when i was directing theater to give a giant heavy feeling of i also use some firefly score for some stuff too. it's great mm. like i can't say enough and he's still working and he's still working and he's a very in-demand composer oh he's still yeah composer. he's like now doing I major a major happy when i see his name on a screen for a movie i'm seeing yeah, yeah. ant-man I, yeah. I giggle, I, I squee during Ant-Man to see that he was doing the score. Yeah, I was just, I just pulled up everything and I was just going to say, yeah, I love his Ant-Man score is great, but he's done so many other things, you know, good, bad, and indifferent. I mean, he, including, apparently he's doing Frozen 2 coming up in 2019 and he's doing Ant, he's doing Ant-Man and Wasp, it's coming out mm-hmm. this summer. I yeah. didn't realize he did the Ant-Man. Yeah, uh, he did the Ant-Man score, which is a lot of fun. 
Yeah, I love that, especially like the when he does the variations on the theme, and you suddenly get like the weird mariachi one over the. Crash He's a genius. He's really the one of the auto stuff. I just yeah, I, I we love see it. Christoph on we see him on screen, don't we? In Restless, doesn't he? I think he so. Like, yeah, uh, we the do band see him in Restless. Giles plays with so. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about okay. him. He's yeah, really he so good. We do love him. Yes, praise, we praise. We love him. Yeah. We yeah. should we should probably wrap up this episode uh, so we can uh, talk about part two, which will be out next week. So until then, yeah. grr arg, grr arg, grr arg, grr arg. We'd like to thank everyone who downloaded the podcast, and an extra special thanks to everyone who shared, liked, and subscribed on social media. So we got another message this week on YouTube, again from our listener, Rachel. And Rachel has just caught up with the episodes and said, I love the new additions to the podcast. You're all awesome. And she particularly loves Andy's cat, River. Well, uh, thank you. No, we love the additions to the podcast for season two and they'll be continuing with us onwards uh through the show and andy's cat i mean like how can we not have river tam on the show i i can tell you it would be very hard to not have river tam on the show because i'm the one who actually edits things and she's always making sure to get her voice in there um i actually am surprised my cats aren't jealous because my uh my cats, uh, Skywalker, Gandalf, and Pond are always sitting in here when I'm recording. It's just they're not quite as vocal as River is. So I just want to shout them out because I love my babies. And Beulah, but she's always sleeping downstairs when I'm recording. If you'd like your comments or questions read on the show, you can contact us on our website, returntothehellmouth.com, on YouTube at Return to the Hellmouth, on Tumblr and Facebook at Return to the Hellmouth, on Twitter at Hellmouth Return, or on email at Return to the Hellmouth at gmail.com, and we'll read your comments on the show. Be sure to rate our show at iTunes and Stitcher, and check out our show merchandise on Tee Public and Redbubble. See you on Tuesday for Becoming Part 2. Grr. Arg.